I've kind of decided to do videos topically. I think that's probably been obvious rather than purely chronologically. So uh, starting a little video here that'll capture some of the uh, initial body uh, stuff that's going on. So what I've got here is the windshield surround. Um, I figure I need to go ahead and get this on so that I can understand exactly how the dash is going to mate up to this and how the brake uh, masters need to be relocated. Kind of the next steps, I think. So um, the previous owner had taped the windshield in with this duct tape. So I've got to get all the duct tape and residue off and then clean up the frames, which Factory 5 didn't bother to paint or powder coat. Obviously can't powder coat them because I can't put the whole thing in the oven. Um, so I just clean it up and paint it. So that's kind of what I'm going to be doing right now. It was actually not as bad as I thought it was getting all the duct tape off. Uh, went at it with, uh, first I just peeled off what I could. I tried to uh, scrape some off with a, a uh, glass scraper here. But it was just too gummy and that didn't work. So uh, I rolled some of it off with my thumb. It would roll up into little balls like that. Um, but then the rest of it I took off with, uh, with solvents. Some uh, xylene worked pretty well. So uh, I got 99% of it off of the xylene. That left a little film, so then I went back with the, uh, the goof off, and that took the film off, so it was good and clean. Then I, uh, I took the metal and I hit it with a flat disc everywhere I could. And then I got a wire brush and some sandpaper out and got as close as I could in here. But like obviously way up in there, I still couldn't sand. So uh, putting a coat of rusty metal primer on it and it'll, uh, it's supposed to convert rust to primer. So I'll let that dry and I'll put some regular primer on it and then I'll put some uh, black enamel on it and uh, put it on the car and that way I'll be able to see where the the dash is gonna come up against the front side and um, also be able to see what I need to do for my, my brake and clutch res reservoirs on the front side. Alright, uh, first step in body. I've got the uh, windshield mounted, which if you go by the factory 5 manual is probably the last thing you do, but uh, I need to do it for several reasons. First of all, I'm getting ready to put the, the dash in, and so I need to see how I'm going to... Uh, I know the factory dash is, is going to be short, and so I'm going to have to fill this gap in here. So I need to know what it is, so that I can go ahead and modify the dash and, and, and get it worked. Um, the other thing is, is I want to be making a custom hardtop for it, and so I needed to know what the roof line was going to look like, obviously. Um, and uh, the other thing was is uh, if you can see here my brake and clutch master cylinders are up under there now, i'm gonna have a dash here so i can't get to them from this side um and i have no idea how factory five expected you to get to them from this side either maybe they just assume you'll never have to bleed your brakes or add new brake or clutch fluid i don't think it works like that what most builders have done is used a remote reservoir and moved it uh, kind of up into this area, which I may do, but I really don't want to because um, if you'll remember, I've talked about I want to have a big uh, reverse scoop in the hood. I actually want to have a, a, a down. Right? I don't want to come off the uh, glass and shoot down and come through here so that the radiator can duct out. Um, and so I, I plan to bring the hood down as close as I can to this bar. Um, now it, it will come at windshield level, so I've probably got room to put remote reservoirs in here, uh, especially if I move them and kind of try to keep them flush with the top of that bar. Um, but I was looking for some other ways. I was thinking that maybe I could, uh, now some builders have just cut this out of the way. Um, the hood comes up to about right here, so it does get hidden, but when you open the hood, you see it and it looks terrible. So I was thinking about cutting it out, but making it um, removable, building a flange in there and using some uh, uh, wing nut 
nuts or Gazoo's fasteners or something so that it's a removable piece that I can pop out, refill the fluids, and then put it back, and it, it looks okay. Um, if I remember, I had a Jaguar XKR uh, that had something similar. It, it had the reverse opening hood that opened to the front, and then up at the front there, it had the black plastic panel like most modern cars have, and it had some removable panels for getting to some fluid reservoirs. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a look at this and see if I can make that happen. That would be my preferred solution to not have to deal with a remote reservoir kit. A, that's more money. B, that's more places to leak. C, that's getting in the way of what I want to do with my hood. So um, I'm going to take a look at that, uh, see what I can do there, and then maybe get the, the dash in here. I don't know, it's pouring rain outside, and the, the dash is back in the, the shed. So if, the, if I get a break in the rain, I'll go grab the dash and bring it in and set it up here and see how it looks with the windshield here. Uh, otherwise, I'm probably going to focus on these uh, reservoirs right here. Um, kind of waiting on parts to do anything else I want to do. I've still got some suspension work I want to do. I'm still troubleshooting the uh, cooling issue, not being able to get it to fill and burp properly with the heater and the thermostat and everything all together. So I think I'm going to work on this for right now. All right, so I've apparently reached that stage in a kit car build where I'm going to spend more time sitting down with a tablet doing research and looking at the car than actually doing anything. Uh, after enough time on the forums, I found some nice uh, pictures here. Let's see if I can get them without a glare of how other people have done it without using a remote kit. So that was, was trimmed out there. And that's completely hidden when you put the, the hood on because the hood comes up. The hood actually comes up into the glass. So the entire section here is hidden. So that is completely hidden. And uh, that was trimmed uh, obviously well enough that it looks very neat and then if you want um, there's somebody who made it a Zeus fastener cover I'm thinking about making something like that uh, except I'll form it out of fiberglass so that it, it curves and matches um, so I think that's the route I'm going to take because I really will, don't want to do remote reservoirs because um, it's going to get in the way of what I want to do with the hood so uh, I'm going to Sharpie, make some markings, and then there's no way I'm going to try and cut it on the car. Um, even though I spent like 20 minutes um, adjusting it to get it where I wanted it, uh, I'm going to take it off and cut it and then adjust it and put it back on again. Okay, uh, took it off. Uh, what I did was I used my straight edge to mark this rail and this rail. And I missed a little bit. It's not perfectly... Uh, in line with those two, but I was trying to come off the back side here and it stand up um, I couldn't really get up under there to try and draw a line on the bottom get it perfectly on it But that's okay because it's gonna be covered um, From here I can easily get to that cap and that cap um, I'd have to use a funnel with a flexible tube, but that's okay. I'm happy with it like that um, What I'm gonna do next um, I got to get the dash in and see how the dash is going to fit, but I don't really want this open and allowing engine compartment hot air to come in up behind the dash. So I'm going to uh, make something that'll come right here and, and enclose this in and make a box right here. I'll probably uh, 3D print it and then uh, maybe uh, put a layer of fiberglass on it just for a little heat resistance, but I, it should be fine. I'll print it out of PETG. It should be fine up under there. And uh, I'll box that in so that uh, it, it's closed off from the engine compartment. And then uh, I'm going to make a, a cover here, kind of like the picture I showed you, but instead of making it out of metal, I'm, uh, I'm once again, I'll 3D print it. Um, so one of my plans uh, coming up in the next couple of weeks, actually, is to start uh, trying to 3D scan the body panels uh, using photogametry, which is... Uh, basically taking a bunch of pictures of it and letting some software work on it. Uh, it's it's not a lot of people have had success doing it on car bodies. Uh, obviously, a lot of people would love to be able to just take pictures of a car and then get a 3D model. Um, but I've been doing a lot of research on it. And, you know, I don't want to get into details. That's going to be a separate video. But basically, I've got the piece here that I cut out. And... Uh, 
it'll be a separate video. I'll go over the 3D, the photogametry 3D scanning. Um, this is simple enough. I could CAD this in in a Fusion without scanning it, but for the purposes of trying to perfect the 3D scanning photogametry of body panels, this is everything about this is what makes photogametry hard. It's flat. It's glossy. Uh, it's hard to get patterns on. So I got a plan. That'll be a separate video. Video will probably get posted before this video actually. Um, but you'll see that video coming out. We'll, we'll do one on photogametry and the success or failure thereof. So, but I'm gonna make a cover here. I'm gonna make a cover for the back and that's taken care of. I'm happy with that. I don't need a remote reservoir kit. Um, I cut it. I, uh, I used, uh, uh, I blended the edges there. I even came over here and blended these edges on the corners at Factory 5 and left them really sharp. I'm just not a fan of sharp edges. I've managed to cut myself up on so many things, reaching in to work on something. So, blended the edges. I'm going to work on a cover for that. Um, I'm going to work on a box for the back. So, I got a little break in the rain right now, so I think I'm going to run out and grab the dash and start setting it up here and seeing how things look. Alright, it's time to start making decisions here because... Uh, building a kit car is uh, exercise and compromise. So this is where the factory gauge cluster would sit, and that's dead middle of it. So if I line that up with the steering column so that the gauge cluster is in the center, then what I wind up with is the end on this side being about even with this peak. But the end on this side could be an outside, so I'm way off center. Um, also, if you if you try and step back and look at where that puts the, the dash in the car in general, um, you can see the shifter is even pretty much with the left edge of the radio console, all that. So it is it is way to the right. So I'm gonna have to shift it off to the left. It's way off to the passenger side, so I gotta shift it to the driver's side. Alright. And uh if I center it up, I think that's about center. What that puts me with is this end is about even with the edge of the windshield. Um and this end is about even with the edge of the windshield. I might be a half an inch off center. Towards the driver's side, which is too far. There we go. I think that's about center. And the one thing you have to remember about the 818 is it's a little funny. The, the, the doors are really wide, and so the doors come in to the inside here. And so all this is uh, gonna, I either gotta trim that off. Or I got to trim the door panel out. I've got plenty of room to do both. Still haven't decided exactly what I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to be putting the coupe windows in, so I got to get the windows before I can decide which one I'm going to trim. Um, so, but if I do that now, if you look at my steering wheel versus my gauge cluster, my gauge cluster is going to be offset to the left. So, sitting down here, you can see. Let me put the steering wheel back up because it's all the way at its lowest to give me room to work here. You can see exactly how stark that's going to be. Um, now, I've got a little bit of wiggle room because I'm not going to use the factory gauge cluster. I am going to use a tablet. Um, and so I can certainly set my tablet as far to the right as I can and get it almost centered and then... Uh, since I'm going to be doing a, a custom display, I don't have to have the display in the center, centered in the center of the tablet. I could have, you know, the, all the stuff I really want over to the right side and then have a menu or ancillary data on the left. And so I think I can make it look pretty good. Um, because I think if I try to center this up, it's just going to be, like I said, the whole thing's going to be so far that way, it's going to be impossible to to make it work and just make the radio and everything uh, be in the wrong spot. So this is about where this thing needs to be. I think this way, this is the next thing I've got to get pinned down is 
how far this way it needs to be. Um, one thing I do notice is that I'm hanging over right here. Um, I've been looking at some pictures online of some of the other factory dashes people have done, and they don't seem to have that issue, but they all have an older dash than me. Most of those dashes came out of the donors, which meant they were from uh, 2000 to 2006, maybe seven. Um, I bought this kit used, the donor was long gone, and the original owner didn't keep the dash. The only dash I could find at a local wrecking yard was a 2010. So I've got a 2010 dash instead of a 2006, and I'm thinking that might be where this issue right here is, but that's not too big of a deal. I can, I can trim this right here. Um, we're already going to have to extend all this, so I can just trim that and make it custom. Uh, it's sitting down below flush with the windshield, so it shouldn't be any problem to get the windshield to seat and seal. So um, what I'm going to do now is start looking at how I'm actually going to physically attach it. Well, first of all, I'm going to make sure it's right fr front and back, and then start looking at how I'm going to physically attach it. But everything's a compromise, right? I, uh, I went to put this cover on right here so I could try and get some front to back and up and down uh sense of where i wanted this thing and i realized that uh, this cover right here was hitting the bolts that i had hanging down on the lowering bracket so i had to flip them upside down they're now sticking up into there which is sticking up into there which is not a big deal so um but what i'm really looking at is i can't get this as low as i want it when i'm looking at where other people online have mounted theirs they've got the uh the top of the blinker assembly now mine is dropped two inches so maybe if I were to move that up two inches about right there um, that's about where they have this line right here between the split between the top and the bottom so even if I move mine up two inches I'm still two inches too high um, I really need that to come down at least two inches possibly even four and I'm wondering if that is going to be one of the things I have to deal with for having a 2010 dash because I just don't well on this side I can see how to get it lower but on this side you know the, the bottom part here the, the bottom of this is sitting on the dash so um, I, I don't know if anybody else has um, uh, notched theirs or what they've done I, I think I'm gonna Maybe send a few emails, make a few phone calls, see what some other people have done to uh, see how they handled that right there. I sent a couple of emails to the guys on the forum who have done the factory OEM dash before. I haven't heard back yet, but the more I think about it, the more I realize that I probably can't do what they do anyway because I collapsed my column four inches and I dropped it two. So to get the gauge section to... Uh, you know, be in a position that it fits with the steering wheel, uh, I'm, I'm going to have to mount mine significantly lower and further back than they did. Because um, I think back is the real key. Collapsing the column four inches was a whole lot. And so they could have had their dash way out here. You know, four inches further out is what, right, right there? They could have had it all the way out there, which would have allowed it to drop down past this bar that I'm hitting because it would have been back here. Um, they also needed a much bigger piece to fill the gap here. So, um, haven't heard back from them, but that, I mean, that's not surprising. I sent an email late at night and it's early Saturday morning. So, um, I'm just going to go ahead and start trimming it with the Dremel and, uh, I'll, I'll try to trim it carefully, uh, so that I can fiberglass it back if I have to. Alright, so you can see I trimmed out this area right here, and now it's sitting really well just like that. Um, my only concern is how tight the blinker stalk is up against this, so I could get that and, and how close I am to that. Um, look at this piece here which I'm going to be modifying anyway. Um, but when you put that on, it's going to completely cover the um, switch that I'm using for the hazard lights. 
So it needs to go back a little bit from where it is. I've got it too far forwards at this point. Um, to do that, it basically means I'm gonna have to notch this, which is fine. I don't need this structure here. I'm just, I guess I'm worried about it getting floppy, but I don't think it will. It's got plenty of structure there, so trim a little more. All right, I think it's much better now. Uh, let's see if I can get a picture here. I can still get to my button. Those are my hazards. Um, I've got about three inches of clearance there on the wiper stalk. Uh, i got plenty of clearance over. Oops. Plenty of clearance over here on the blinker stalk. So I think I've, I've got it about where I want it, front to back and up and down. Um, you know, my only concern looking at it here is the steering wheel is right in the middle of my gauge cluster. I mean, this is pretty much the view I have. So, um, I know a lot of people have, have, uh, well, I don't say a lot of people, but I know at least several people have, have complained about that. And one of the guys that, uh, has been talking to me about my, um, SSM to the CAN bus project is wanting to do it because he wants to put a heads up display because he can't see it in his gauges because of the steering wheel. So I think that's just a problem with the design. Um, to be honest, I'm not too sure how Subaru gets around it. I guess I need to look at some pictures of a factory Subaru dash. Um, I guess, I mean, it seems like the top of the steering wheel should line up with this right here and, and maybe I should be going for that. Uh, let me take a look and see if I can keep dropping the dash down. I mean, it would look a lot better, I think, the further I drop the dash. So let me see if I can get it lower. So I dropped it down and now I'm having second thoughts. Um, I took some picture. I uh, looked at some pictures of the dash in a Subaru, and the reason it it doesn't sit so low is the wheel so much bigger. Uh, this is probably a 12 or a 13 inch wheel, and a factory wheel is probably 15 or 16 inches. So it's it's got a lot bigger circle. Um, I I can certainly make this work. Uh, but I'm starting to have doubts if it looks as good as I want. And also I'm having concerns about how it might made up with the doors if it's sunk too low. So I think I might actually pick it back up another inch. Um, since I'm going to be making a custom area here for my tablet, um, I'll just handle the up and down of the uh, uh, gauge placement when I do that. Now I've got it exactly where I want it, now I've got to figure out how to attach it. Um, and so the first thing I think I want to do is make some brackets that attach to these three pieces here and then sit there. Now I don't know if I actually want to bolt them in because I'm not sure how I'd actually do that. Uh, because I am going to extend this dash to come out beyond the windshield. So I won't be able to reach in from this side, and I don't think I'll be able to reach in from the other side. But um, if I make them where they at least rest there, it'll keep it from rocking back and forth this way. Um, and I may be able to design them so that they would snap in and snap out. I'm not exactly positive, but for now I'm just going to make them where they stand there to keep my uh, tilt where I need it. And then once I'm happy with my tilt, I will, um, I'll start looking at how I can attach it in the front. So, off to the computer for a little bit. Attempted to mount the dash. I remember that one of the things I had on my to-do list was to convert the cruise control levers from ground triggered to positive triggered. And so I, uh, I fired up the, the ROM Raider and connected to the ECU and started trying to figure out the buttons and that led me into trying to figure out the brake switches uh, and the clutch switch because those tied into the cruise control logic and it turns out that those needed to be 12 plus as well so uh, but my my coach that triggers my tail lights is ground triggered so um, what I thought was going to be a 10 minute job to move one ground wire to a, an ignition wire wound up being 
three and a half hours of re-engineering all the wiring for the brake, clutch, and cruise switches. Uh, but it's all done now. Uh, the, the, the brake and the clutch switch that go to the ECU pass 12 volts when you're not pressing the pedal. So if it doesn't get a signal, it thinks the pedal is, pedal is pressed. And then the, um, the cruise sends 12 volts wants to turn it on and then down sends 12 volts to one pin, up sends 12 volts to another, and then if you pull in for cancel, it sends 12 volts to the same pin that detect the up and the down, and that's how it knows you've got that extra pull there. So all that's done, steering wheel's back on. Uh, the part to uh, for the center dash brace is finished 3D printing, so We'll grab some lunch and then come see how that brace fits up. Right, so there's the 3D printed brace that I made. Um, and it holds really steady there, so it's not rocking back and forth now. So now I'll be able to kind of crawl up under the dash and make some measurements and figure out how I'm going to attach this thing in the front. Um, also, Probably I'm going to have to go grab the windshield and set it in here so that I can see what kind of clearance I got and what I'm going to have to do in this corner to make everything fit like I want it to. I may have to go over and look at another Builders 818 who's got his doors and all that cow together so that I can see how all that's going to fit. Uh, but for now, uh, I'm going to figure out how to securely attach this so that uh, I can start making good measurements and uh, figuring out how I'm going to modify it. I'm printing the uh, first bracket for the front side of the AC condenser. And, uh, let's see. Fairly simple bracket. Let's see if I can get it to show up on the screen here. Oh, I need two hands to zoom around. Hold on. Fairly simple bracket. Uh, mount to the dash there, uh, come down, and then mount to the frame there. So uh, I've got it printing over here. I print uh, with a with an IDEX, an independent dual extruder, uh, and I do that because it allows me to print supports in one material and part in another, and then I, I use dissimilar materials so that the supports won't stick to the part. Um, you can even print like a, an upside down bucket and uh, the supports just pop right out. So I'm putting supports in PETG and the part in PLA for this one. Sometimes I invert it, depends on where the part's going. Um, this one's going to be in the cabin. I'm not worried about heat uh, and I prefer the stiffer PLA over the PETG's temperature resistance. So. Uh, once this thing gets done, we'll go see if I uh, guess right on the angles. It's hard to uh, measure an angle on something like that on the dash, but we'll see how close it looks once I get done. The, the bracket for the AC is, uh, is done printing. As you can see, it, I've already popped it loose. This is a magnetic uh, cover. You pop it off and then bend it, and your parts will pop right off. And uh, that's the, the PLA in black and PETG is in gray. And as you can see, you can just one-handed break it away. Um, it's, it's so awesome, man. I remember the days of printing everything in, in one uh, material. And you could spend an hour trying to clean the part up, breaking all the uh, supports off. And, uh, you know, that, that they have uh, soluble supports, which is what everybody tends to talk about using is like using HIPS, H-I-P-S or PLA and you print it and then you throw it in the bathtub or a big five gallon bucket of water and the HIPS will dissolve and the PLA will stay. That's kind of messy and takes a long time and this PLA stuff just in the PETG, they pop right apart. Um, when you, I print with a bed of 75 and the PLA stays a little soft uh, while you're printing but it's never caused me any issues. Now this part is downright ugly. Um, 
That's because this is a brand new printer and I'm still working out the slicer settings. Um, I've also, the slicer I was used to, which was slicer with a three, uh, doesn't do great for the, the independent dual extruder, so I've moved to Simplify 3D. Um, and so I'm still trying to get used to it. But this uh, is going to sit just like this. That'll bolt to the frame, and then that piece will come up. And that, this is like kind of above the glove box uh, near the AC vent. So it'll, the dash will, I'll put, uh, I'll put some rib nuts in those two holes. Uh, the dash will bolt to that, and then... So that'll bolt to the frame, and then when I put the dash up there, I'll be able to run two bolts into the rib nuts. So, uh, we'll try that in a couple of days. Uh, I don't think I'm going to be able to get to the shop. It's certainly late tonight, and I don't think I have time tomorrow. So, a couple of days I'll get out there and uh, see how it fits. And if it fits, I'll bolt it in tight and then move on to making the next one. All right, let me do a quick little video here. Uh, kind of wrap up this segment of the dash so that I can go ahead and get that video posted and move on. So um, I printed, uh, I showed the other day I had printed the uh, piece that I wanted to mount uh, right. This thing will never stay still. Um, mount right here. You can see I've actually got it uh, screwed in there. Uh, on the dash and then coming down and mount right here on the frame um, and as you can see Part of it is attached to the dash and the other half is not the uh, the print failed and fell off. So um, I'll talk about that in just a minute uh, for those who are interested, but uh, Kind of where I am is you know, I've been talking for a long time. I wanted to put the dash in I wanted to put the dash in Why do I want to put the dash in I'm going to put the dash in so that I could uh, see exactly how the hood and the windshield came together with the dash. Um, I wanted to start working on the custom gauge cluster physically, how the tablet's going to fit in there. I've, I've had some videos on the electronics behind it, but physically how it's going to fit in there. Um, I wanted to go ahead and wire the radio uh, and the, the backup camera and all of that so that I could be done with wiring in the cabin. So that was what was driving me to want to put the dash in. But uh, the more I work on it, the more I've talked to the, some of the people who have done this before, I just, I think I'm going to have to wait because the biggest thing in making this um, factory Subaru dash work is how you tie it in to the doors uh, and make the door panels match. And not only am I doing the custom dash, only the custom door panels, and then with my column being dropped and compressed, dropped two inches and compressed four, um, I can't use other people's mounting points as a reference. So uh, I think if I try and mount the dash right now, I'm going to find myself undoing it and redoing it later to make it match whatever I do with the doors. So I think as bad as I want the dash mounted, I need to take this, put it back in the storage unit, and uh, wait until I have the doors done to focus on the dash. So um, that's that's kind of uh, where I'm at on the dash. I'm gonna wrap that up. What's next? That's body. I'll probably even do a what's next video here in the next week or so, really talking about uh, the shift in direction from mechanical to cosmetic and what my vision for the car is and kind of what to expect out of the channel. Um, you know, so far everything I've done is well, I won't say it's been by the book. I haven't done anything by the book. Um, but it hasn't been, other than maybe the shifter, things that really add a wow factor to the car. Um, the body is really one where I want to do a wow factor. I really want to do a lot of customization on the body. So I'll do a video on that. Um, but for now, the dash, going back in the storage unit, and it's just going to have to wait until the doors are finished. Um, I said I'd mention about the failed 3D print a little bit. You know, the other day I threw around some terms like um, IDEX and Slicer. And I didn't really explain what any of that meant. Um, I realized that most people who are watching this video are watching it because of a car. And so they might not really understand a lot or be familiar with 3D printing. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about that because 3D printing is going to be coming in big when I get into the body modifications as well. 
because uh, I'm going to be using the, the 3D printer to print some components uh, or, or some sample components for sizing and testing and uh, using to base fiberglass around just using like a buck or a core for the fiberglass. So um, the, the gist of 3D printing is that you design something in a 3D computer environment such as SOLIDWORKS or AutoCAD 3D or Fusion 360. I use Fusion 360 because it's free for hobbyists and I don't have to buy a license for it. Um, and then once it's designed in a three-dimensional format, then you have to get it to the, uh, the printer. So um, the printer, when we do 3D printing, there's two types. Um, there's a, a filament based and a, a resin based and so a filament based is what I have and what that does is it literally takes a string of filament and runs it through a really hot nozzle and squirts it out at a really hot temperature um, and then that nozzle moves around and so you draw with molten plastic whatever you want the very bottom layer to be and then the nozzle moves up just a tiny bit and it draws another layer and because it's coming out really hot it sticks and melts to the layer below it and so that's why when you look at these parts you can see actual layers where it printed a layer at a time um, and so when I threw out the term IDAX independent that means independent dual extruder IDEX for extruder um, what that meant was my printer has two extruders on it which is a fairly new concept uh, you know maybe a couple of years old when i've been 3d printing for over 10 years now so in the in the era of 3d printing it's a fairly new development um you, you, old school printers only had one extruder and so you can only print with one filament um, the reason people go to two is either to print in two colors or print in two materials and like i explained the other day i printed in two materials because uh, if you, when you're printing with molten plastic, you can't print in air. You can only print if there's something to support it. So if you have to print something with an overhang, like this had an overhang there, um, then you have to print something below it to hold it up. And so by printing those in two dissimilar materials that won't stick together, uh, you can make it really easy to uh, support something that's floating in air and still be able to cleanly take away the support later so that you're not having to sand and file and smooth your print. Um, the other term I threw around was a slicer. And what a slicer does is it's a piece of software that takes your three-dimensional object and turns it into the actual tool path that you're going to use. So a lot of people who are watching cars are familiar with, a uh, car channel are familiar with CNC's. And if you're familiar with a CNC, then you know, it's basically the reverse of a 3D printer. A 3D printer takes an empty space and runs a tool path from bottom to top to extrude a product. Whereas a CNC machine takes a block of something, starts at the top, and generates a tool path to shave away from top to bottom the part that you want to have left. So it's almost like CNC in reverse. And um, the slicer is what actually generates the tool path and tells the, the extruder, you know, how fast to move, what direction to move in, how much filament to extrude while it's moving. Um, and so this part here failed because of a bad slice. And what I mean by that is the program that I used to generate the tool path made some bad decisions. If you look at this, uh, I'll see if I can get it to focus here. Uh, you see how it basically drew a T. When you come down here and look at this end, it made a curve. It curved back around. Um, and so it drew a T, and then it drew another, because this, if you remember, looked like an I. So it drew a T, and then it came back and it drew another bar on the bottom, rather than drawing an I. Why it did that, I'm not too sure. I'm still getting familiar with this new software. But what that led to was that this was one solid piece and then the other bar that was right here was basically another piece that was kind of laid on top of there and yes this piece was hot when it went down and this piece was hot when it went down so it did have some adhesion 
it held together while I was walking around with it and drilling it and all that. But once I put weight of the dash on it, because that wasn't printed as a solid piece and it just had a little bit of layer of attachment there, it snapped off. So uh, this is a 3D print that failed because of a bad slice. Because you can see that nothing broke right here. It's not like um, there's any jagged marks there where this plastic itself broke. This was where it tried to put two layers together in a sideways manner instead of a top and bottom manner, which is, is not designed to do. And there was, there was an air gap in there. And so it did not stick well at all. Um, so that's, uh, that's just a little bit about 3D printing and what happened there and uh, what's going to be going on. When we get into the body, we'll be 3D printing, uh, you know, maybe vents or louvers or uh, brackets or all kinds of stuff we'll be doing uh, to help with the body modifications. So um, just a little primer on some of the language you may hear thrown around. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up all the Dash videos together and I'm going to get them posted as a topical as dash part one or something like that even though it's going nowhere you may even find a, a, a cool title like quicksand or going nowhere or something like that who knows um, but the dash is going back in the storage unit uh, the stock gauge cluster will be going back in for now uh, just getting zip tied back to the dash frame so that uh, I can still drive it move it around um, it's Memorial Day weekend, so my, my hope is to get the cooling system wrapped up before Memorial Day. That way I can maybe uh, do some go-karting and driving around and having fun over the long weekend. And then um, get started on the body mods after that.